Amen. Shalom and welcome all to another 1C22 live streaming event. We are gearing up for the ultimate return of the Lord with every single day, the, despite what the news is saying, despite what you're feeling, despite what you're thinking right now. Faith is not a feeling. Faith, as Hebrews describes it, is the evidence of things hoped for, of the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Reminding God's people we walk by faith, not by sight, not by our senses, not by what we think, not what, what we feel, but what we know God's word says. Now, automatically, when people hear the word faith, and sometimes in certain camps, their tenors may go off because they might think it's this type of faith movement or this type of faith movement, but I'm simply talking about the biblical faith. The same saving faith is the same sa faith that keeps you, that preserves you, that delivers you, and also protects you. So it is not wrong, people of God, to have a faith and the loving Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, who died for your sins, rose again on the third day, to not just give you eternal life in heaven someday up in the clouds, but for his presence, his reality also exists here on earth. And as the prayer goes, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We need faith here on earth to access the reality of God's blessing and God's provision and God's divine protection, Kiba Shemaim, as it is in heaven. Amen? Well, um couple quick announcements. Um, we have uh, been giving updates as far as the prayer room goes, still just taking it literally week by week. Um, we are uh, just one step closer to finishing the prayer room. Um, as I mentioned last week, uh, we are uh, kind of working on the technical side um, as far as getting certain things with our, our videos, with our, with our uh, website. We are um, actually uh, walking through a test run with our actually priest of prayer sign up schedule. Um, again, every, there's been no official announcements of when the actual launch is. We're, as each week goes by, uh, as things get drawn out, we're still waiting for the final confirmation of of God and the government to, to, to uh, come in, in, in alignment. And there will be, just like with everything else, an official announcement of when Priest of Prayer Prayer Room is officially starting. But that's why, again, uh, my responsibility, my job is just to have everything up and running by the time everything opens up. And that's what I've been diligent to do. Um, the scheduling system that we have online, uh, as you go to 1c22.com or 1c22.org, either one will get you there. Um, you, you'll see, you'll say schedule appointment, you'll hit on Priest of Prayer, and literally you get to click in your hour, and it'll say, you know, male or, or male or female, but specifically single male or single females, because uh, we ain't trying to have, uh, you know, s single dudes. It's not a, it's not a dating site. So it, we are looking for an agreement, women with women, men with men, unless, of course, you're married. Um, but when we get to that point, um, there will be, as um, promised and as scheduled, there will also be a training uh, day or a couple of training days events for uh, just so that everyone literally gets on the same page as well as the uh, kickoff services that we will be doing with Overland Park First Assembly of God. So the prayer launch, the date of that, of the prayer launch room, as, as well as the scheduling service are tentative, depending on, of course, on the scheduling with uh, God and the government. Uh, so, um, but meanwhile, uh, I continually ask that you continually pray for the, the finishing of the, basically it's just aesthetic things we have to do when it comes to the prayer room, most of the, um, the major construction, the major painting, most of the, the honestly, the hard work has been done, um, but uh, the little things also matter too. So, uh, but, but as each week goes by, there's just more and more progress. Um, I know we've been, uh, you know, I've been talking a lot about the prayer room. It's not about the room. It's not about the building. It's about the prayer and the power of agreement that is necessary. And boy, I, I, am I telling you, if, if, if right now people have not understood why prayer is necessary, if there's any time when, boy, prayer should be a priority, it is right now in this season. Where as the, when, when Jesus says in, in uh, Matthew 24 and, and Luke 19, when he's talking about the end times, and he says, men's hearts failing them for fear. Men's hearts failing them because of fear. And this is why I have been consistently for over a month now preaching faith, 
faith, faith. Faith is the antithesis of fear. Now, keep in mind, we understand as 1 John says, perfect love casts out fear. Those who, are free, those who are afraid or feared have not been perfected in Yahweh God's love. If you don't know that Jesus loves you, if you don't know that God's plan does not have, uh, is not interrupted, no virus can interrupt Jesus' love for you, and no virus can interrupt Jesus' plans for your life, period. Amen? Um, so... As we uh, continue with the, the, the word of the Lord, we have been looking at uh, Passover um, in teaching on why it is necessary to connect the dots with Passover. Uh, one of the things that I brought up last week was the, the uh, crisis of the context and how when things are taken out of context, that's, that's where the crisis is, the crisis of the context of taking Christ out of context, the crisis of taking, when you take Christ out of context, and it leads to the crisis of taking the crucifixion out of the context. And the reason why, um, as it was impressed in my heart to, to bring some, some unity on the, uh, in God's people, when it comes to this Passover thing, we can all get on the same page if you believe the Bible. The Bible simply states that, and it was the Passover, as Christ said, and in two days the Son of Man will be crucified. As 1 Corinthians 5 uh, says, and we'll uh, break that down a little bit more tonight, but Christ is called our Passover. So it is not uh, putting you back under the law. It is not some legalistic standard. If you believe the Bible, then all you have to do is just read it and then let God's word be God's word. Amen? Uh, so before we go into God's word, I want to uh, pray. Father, in Yeshua Jesus' name, I just thank you for every opportunity to break open the word of life. I deny the power of the flesh, Lord God. I ask that you allow me to be in your Holy Spirit to communicate the oracles of God. I ask, Father, that you would lose wisdom and understanding for, for anyone that is uh, watching online right now or anyone's going to listen to this later on YouTube. I simply ask, Father, for as your word says, that with meekness we receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Save our souls with the word of God in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So what I want to do tonight is make sure that we are not escaping the reality of God's covenantal protection in Jesus, the Passover lamb. Make sure that regardless of what the news may say, whatever your friends may say, make sure that you are not escaping the reality of the covenantal protection and provision in Jesus, the Messiah, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus 23, uh, verse 2, now when it talks about the feast, it, I, I repeat, it does not call them uh, Israel's feast. He says, Yahweh says, these are my feast. He says, these are my feast, Mo'adai. Mo'adai Yahweh. Literally, when, when someone, so sometimes you hear the word feast, sometimes you hear the word uh, uh, festival, uh, but literally this specific word is not just feast or festival, it's literally appointed times. His appointed times. So this is the challenge to all of God's people in this specific epoch of time. Make sure that you are not so busy trying to get God on your schedule that you forget to be on his schedule. This is the most important time when he says they're his feast. So the reason why we break down these feasts, or, or sometimes I consider this a 1C22 distinctive, is because I am interested in being in time with God. I'm interested in walking where he walks, doing what he does, but also doing what he does when he does it. Sometimes we're always fixated on what to do. We want, we want to know how to do it, but then you have to understand the timing is just as important. When God does something is just as important to God as what he is doing. So when he says, these are my feasts in Leviticus chapter 23, when you skip down to verse 5, he says on the 14th day of the first month is Yahweh's Passover. So this is God saying he takes it personal. He doesn't call it Israel's Passover. He doesn't call it Jewish Passover. He makes sure you understand that these are the feasts of the Lord, Yahweh God's Passover. As we look at 1 Corinthians 5, which I quoted a little bit earlier, um, I want to dive into that passage a little bit more uh, I, I held some stuff back last week on purpose because there's a lot that I had to, to, to set the tone 
for, for these next few weeks. Um, I really didn't think that I was going to necessarily go as deep as the Spirit of the Lord had me prepare this week on this topic because, you know, I... Most of my people, most of here, one seat to two, we've heard some of this or most of this. Um, but then I'm reminded that there's people that don't understand why one C22 does what it does, the way they do it, or in general, they don't understand what the feast of the Lord have to do with a quote unquote New Testament Gentile Christian believer. So this is the other reason why uh, the Lord impressed it upon my heart to make sure that I, I am faithful to the text. So therefore, I am not going to put experience over exegesis. Regardless of what you've experienced in Christianity, regardless of what you've experienced in churches, or what you may, well, I've never heard that before. Well, at the end of the day, it's about the exegesis. Properly reading from the text and simply saying what God said the way he said it. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, and what I stress and emphasize when we look at this text is this is a New Testament epistle that the Apostle Paul, who was a Jew himself, wrote. And after Christ has died, after Christ has fulfilled the law, after Christ has done all the quote-unquote uh, uh, cessationist and, and all the arguments of, against, of anti, all the antinomian arguments of why we don't need to even care about the Old Testament or any of these festivals, in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy it, I came to fulfill it. Now, what has been overlooked with the expression destroy and fulfill, in some rabbinical circles, their fulfill and destroy are actually a Hebrew idiom. To destroy something is actually to interpret incorrectly. To fulfill something is actually to interpret correctly. So when you uh, go back to Matthew 5 and you're looking at verse 17, 18, and 19, when Jesus is saying, I didn't come to destroy the Torah. I didn't come to interpret the Torah incorrectly. I came to fulfill it. I came to correctly interpret the Torah. That's why when Jesus is having discussions with Pharisees and Sadducees, he is not saying, no, I don't care about the Sabbath. I'm not keeping the Sabbath because I'm the sign I'm changing all that. They're discussing how the Sabbath should be observed because this is about the interpretation of the Torah, not the elimination of the Torah. So then he says, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. So the interpretation is important. Now, when you go to, again, verse 17, 18, and 19, Matthew 5, then he says, and whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be least in the kingdom of God. The opposite, he also reiterates, whoever keeps one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be greatest. So wait a minute. So now we're not just talking about, oh, Christ died. He's fulfilled this. So this isn't necessary anymore. Jesus goes beyond that, talks about you better interpret it right. And then you better be careful how it is taught. So all I'm doing is I'm just trying to keep that standard. Listen, I have no delusions of grandeur that I will be or, or that I am the greatest person in the kingdom of God, but I ain't trying to be the least either. So therefore, I take it very seriously when Yahweh God says certain things like, uh, these are my feast. That is me interpreting the Torah correctly, saying what God said is those are his feast. So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul, a Jewish believer, after Christ is crucified, he's also interpreting the Torah as such. And he says, Christ is our Passover. He was sacrificed for us. And then he says, let us keep the feast. But let us keep the feast. Now, hold on. I understand there's other things that he says after that. There's a dot, dot, dot after that. But I just want to go back to, he says, Passover, but then he says, keep the feast. Now, remember, Passover is connected to something, and that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Feast of Unleavened Bread. Chag Matzot. Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when he's saying He's talking about Passover, Christ was crucified, but then he's saying, let us keep the feast. Now, in Exodus 12, in Exodus 12, that's where you first get the, 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 how the blood of the lamb is supposed to be applied on the doors. He's clearly talking about the Passover, 
But then he says in verse 15, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day, you remove leaven from your house. You eat unleavened bread for seven days. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you remove the leaven from your house. So, this is the dot I want to connect for you tonight. Christ, our Passover sacrifice, let us keep the feast. This is sandwiched between, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. If you're going through your Bibles at home, stay in Exodus 12, stay in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, go ahead and, and uh, get Leviticus 23, because those are the three passages that we're going to be running back and forth through tonight. So in back, verse 7, he says, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump since you are unleavened. You are unleavened. This whole feast of uh, unleavened bread that's connected to the Passover when he says, let us keep the feast. What are you supposed to do? That uh, Exodus 12 says, you remove the leaven. You're purging the leaven out of your, out of your house. But guess what? The application is, that's what you're supposed to do with yourself. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. For Christ, our Passover was sacrificed for us. So let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven of malice, wickedness, but unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The application for this Passover feast of unleavened bread cannot be understated right now. This is important. When I'm talking about the difference between Passover and Easter, one of the things that I like to highlight is the Gentile application, the Gentile imposition that was by the Council of Nicaea. You make it one day, boom, you talk about the resurrection, you go home, uh, eat your ham, you do all the stuff, you, eat, you get some eggs, and then it's over. The reason why God wanted me to continue this series is because for the believer who has received Christ the Passover lamb, it's not over. God has actually just started something that is even continuing today. Purge out the old leaven. You keep the feast for seven days. The application of leaven, the obvious application is that it represents sin. Okay, as believers, yes, you should be constantly, you should be always aware of sin, you should be dodging sin. However, we don't always take sin seriously. So here is an opportunity to align with God's timing where because now the blood has been sacrificed, the blood of the lamb, Christ has been sacrificed, the blood which forgives our sins, but now there's still some internal cleaning that we need to do. So every time when Passover comes, I go seven days, dodging the uh, unleavened bread. But I'm not simply doing a religious ritual. Those seven days, my prayer time is not asking for God to give me things. My prayer time is not asking for God to do this for me or God, I need this or all the other needs that maybe I could be asking for. My seven days of prayer time, a feast of unleavened bread, are consecrated about any sin that needs to be confessed or repented of. Create in me a clean heart, heart O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I'm walking through. Now listen, they do this on... Uh, um, Yom, Yom Kippur, uh, it's literally, they'll, they'll have a list of sins where they're just going, God, forgive me if I even looked at this. Forgive me if I even thought about this. But at the actually, but Yom Kippur is one day, whereas Feast of Unleavened Bread, it's God saying, you take sin seriously. Purge it out. Anything you need to, it's like the first message that I gave uh, online with the whole Noah's Ark story. Things that need to die should die. Things that you need to cut out of your life, you need to cut out. Things that you need to quit, knock it off, get rid of, whether it's relationships, things, people. It's, this is the time of purging from your life. And don't be, that's why also 
Don't be surprised when things in your spirit keep rising up and you feel like, oh, that needs to be checked. Oh, that needs to be. Don't be surprised when people just may just leave and get out of your life. If, if you've asked God to purge, that purging will happen. Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are unleavened. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us, so let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven of malice and wickedness, but unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, the other thing that needs to, to, to be connected as we uh, connect these dots is if you look at all of the things that Feast of, of Unleavened Bread represents, it is necessary that you keep uh, in mind all the things that also happen during the Passover. So during the Passover, it wasn't simply uh, let's make sure that we get this lamb and we butcher him and put this blood on the door. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the other thing that happens is that they were, they were told that, that, when, they, they, that they, when they leave, that they're going to leave high-handedly. They're told that when they leave, when God takes them out of the land of Egypt, that they're not leaving empty-handed. And what happens is in this season... We always look at well, what we're losing. We always look at what we're losing. We always look at what we're losing. Well, well, I don't want to lose uh, this job. I don't want to lose this relationship. I don't want to lose it. But what, at the end of the day, when God is purging stuff, he's simply taking that out of the way so that he can give you something better. So thank God for everything that he purges. Now, remember, in uh, uh, John 15, when Jesus is talking about purging, he's talking about he wants you to bear fruit. We all, okay, praise God, fruit, 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 fruit. But he says the, the branches that don't bear fruit, they're thrown in the fire. And then he says he prunes certain things or he purges certain things for the purpose of what? That new, better fruit may grow in its place. Do not despise the new fruit that God is trying to bring in your life because you're still holding on to the old things that God is trying to get rid of. So as we look at this Feast of Unleavened Bread, it is important to make sure that we are okay with it. Just, you know, just practice it right now. Jesus, I'm okay with everything that you take away. Yeshua Jesus, I'm okay with everything or everyone that you take away. Purging is never a bad thing in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Now, the other thing that we're going to uh, hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm trying not to uh, overwhelm anyone with all of this, quote, unquote, Hebrew Jewish stuff. And I'm going to be very uh, purposeful tonight that if you really look at your Bible as a consistent story, whether it's in the Old Covenant or whether it's in the New Covenant, it's still the same story, the same God who's showing you how he's redeeming his people, Jew and Gentile. If we truly want to see God do a work in our lives and do a work in the nations and do a work in Israel, we have to make sure that we are being obedient to God's timetable, but also being obedient to the strategy that Yahweh God has set before us that we may come into the fullness of the revelation of his son and all of the people in the souls he wants to redeem. And that's what I really want you to get into your spirit tonight. I'm not interested in you using this simply to beat up the, you know, take this information and now we're at war with each other and beating up all of our brothers and sisters in the faith because, well, they're doing Easter and we know the truth and we know that it's Passover. Okay, well, remember, we speak the truth in love. However, the things that are necessary to learn of your Bible is if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then you better make sure for real faith that you're preaching a real word. So as we continue with this Passover uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread understanding, if you look at it in the, the perspective of, a, of the eyes of a, of a first century believer, they've purged out the old leaven. And remember, 1 Corinthians 5, it starts off talking about what? 
It talks about a horrible act of fornication that's happening in the church. It's specifically related, <coughs> excuse me, specifically relating to a story of horrible sin that's taking place in the church. And so when he connects the dot of purging out the old leaven, it's connected to a specific sin. Colossians 2 says we, by removing, what are we supposed to do with the leaven? Remove it. Putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Removing or putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The purging, Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So now, purging your conscience from dead works, because here's the other problem when people talk about repentance, like, oh, it just means change your mind. Purge your conscience from dead works. So <clears throat> it's not just what you think, it's also connected to what you do. Now, as we look at the, the entire scope of of Hebrews 9, 14, um, I hope that, that, I hope that what is communicated tonight, it does not, um, it does not interfere with anything that you know to be true about Christ. Whatever's taught tonight, do not let it interfere with anything that you know to be true about Christ. If it says, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works? Why is that necessary? If you are dead in your trespasses and in sins, as Ephesians states, you are dead in your trespasses and in your sins. The only life-giving source is the blood that cleanses you from those sins. Those who are dead in trespasses and sins. So, Hebrews, knowing the reality of the forgiveness of sins through the, 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 the atonement, through the blood of the Lamb, connecting it with Christ, says, wait a minute. When they took the Passover Lamb and the blood was applied to the doors... That was enough. The, the, the destroying angel would, would pass them by. God, as we spoke last week, I believe it meant God was literally hovering over them. He was making sure that his people were safe. But if the blood of a bull, of a goat, of a lamb would have that much power in the old covenant, Hebrews 9, 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. If the blood of Christ is taken advantage of, which means it's used to simply justify continuing in sin, then you've missed the point of the purging of sin. Purging of sin is the elimination of it, not the justification of a perpetual, continuous, rebellious move in that sin. How much more should the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So 1 Corinthians 15, this is the gospel. One, the Messiah, Christ Jesus, died, buried, and rose again. There are seven feasts that are talked about in Israel. I made a comment last week that all of them are connected to what Jesus has done or will do. If we count these, there's the spring feast, and then there are the fall feast. The spring feast have four, the fall feast have three. <clears throat> If we've already talked about 
Passover, that's one. Feast of unleavened bread, that's two. Then three and four is what we're going to finish with talking about tonight. Three and four. Christ has risen from the dead and become the first fruits of all those who have slept. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, Christ, the gospel is Christ died, first feast, Passover. Christ was buried, second feast, because what do you do with the leaven? Remember, when Christ was on the cross, he didn't stay on the cross. They literally took him down and buried him. He took all of our sins on the cross. As Christ takes our sins on the cross, he's buried. That's what Christ does with our sins. He separates us from our sins as far as the east from the west, but he also buries those sins. That's why we are buried with him in baptized. In, in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of his life. Feast of unleavened bread, second feast, representing the, 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 the being, being buried with Christ, representing the burial of our sin. But the third thing that 1 Corinthians says, and Christ also resurrected. Christ has resurrected from the dead, and he has become the first fruits. But it doesn't start, it doesn't stop there. If Christ has resurrected from the dead and has become the first fruits of all those who have slept, what did Leviticus 23 say was supposed to happen? As we go to Leviticus 23, let's make sure that we get this. Uh, uh, I want you to see the difference. Something unique happens in Leviticus 23 that does not happen in Numbers 28. The seven feasts are, are talked about in uh, Leviticus 23 and in Numbers 28. Something happens in Leviticus 23 that does not happen in Leviticus 28. Specifically, in Leviticus 23, verses 10 and 11. It says that the priest, you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Hmm. Which Sabbath is he talking about? The first concern or problem that's about to happen is when God talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when he talks about the Passover, he also says, and you shall do no work on it. When we think of Sabbath, we think, or you should think, Friday night, because remember, the days actually start at night, to Saturday night, Sabbath. That's the normal seventh-day Sabbath. However, the holy days, Passover, Feast and Liberty, are also considered Sabbaths. Why is this important? Because the dispute arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now remember, if you're going to take the first fruits, and this is what we talked about last week, the first thing that comes up out of the ground, you wave it before Yahweh God. That is the first fruits offering, representing Jesus being the first one to rise from the dead, Never to die again, by the way. That is the unique difference. Yes, we understood other people were resurrected, but Jesus, the first one to rise again from the grave, never to die again. Yes, Lazarus was resurrected, but he also died again. Jesus is the first and the last. He's he, he's the one who lives and was dead, but now he's alive forevermore. So when Christ represents the first fruit, it says that, that fruit you're supposed to wave after the Sabbath. So now you have a conundrum. Which Sabbath? Is it supposed to be the Sabbath, the regular weekly seven-day Sabbath, the one that begins Friday night and Saturday night? Or is it supposed to be the Sabbath, which would be the day after Feast of Leavened Bread, the day after uh, Passover? Which Sabbath? That is the Pharisaical and uh, and, and Sadducean debate, because the other thing that we do in Gentile circles, we assume that Pharisees and Sadducees believe the same thing. They actually didn't. 
That's why many Pharisees, it was lot, that's why Paul was a Pharisee. Actually, Paul still considered himself a Pharisee. So they still, because the Pharisees, Acts chapter 23, verse 8, quick, quick, quick. How do you know the difference? Quick, Acts 23, verse 8. The Sadducees do not believe in a resurrection. They do not believe in angels. They do not believe in spirits. But the Pharisees believe in both. So that's why it was easier for Pharisees to come to the Messiah because they believed in a resurrection. They believed in angels, but the Sadducees did not. So the Sadducees were the ones who said, no, 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 it's the normal weekly seven-day Sabbath. The Pharisees, however, they were saying, well, no, it's, it's, he says you wave it after the Sabbath. We know that the Passover, Feast of Lemon Bread, we know that's a Sabbath. So whether or not you choose to believe, well, you're supposed to wave it on the Sabbath after the normal, or the day after the normal Sabbath, or whether or not it's after the Passover, the actual day itself, or Feast of Leavened Bread. Here's what I want you to understand. Why that needed to be waved. Why did that need to be waved? Because what Leviticus says is, that shall be waived for you to get favor or to get the, or for God to have fine favor or grace in God's sight for you. Christ is the first fruits that rose from the dead. But he didn't die for his sins. He died for your sins. The first fruit resurrection that the priest, remember Christ is also the Kohen Hagadol, he's also the high priest. The high priest waves in front of the father, but he's also, it is operating as an intercessory act on behalf of God's people. So as Christ uh, being the first fruits and he is raised, risen from the dead, it says that this first fruit Sabbath, the, the, after the Sabbath, you bring it and you wave it. Now, if we are really uh, paying attention to why all these things are, are, are necessary. First Corinthians continues and says, but each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, those that belong to Christ. That's where you come in. Because what Leviticus 23 and what Numbers 28 say is the reason why you need to know that first Sabbath is because you need to count seven more Sabbaths. You can't count the seven Sabbaths if you haven't paid attention to the first Sabbath. What was the countdown of the seven Sabbaths? It's the holy day called Shavuot. Most Christians don't know what that means because it means feast of weeks. So that's why in Acts chapter 2, it says, when the day of Pentecost, Pentecost is the, the word Shavuot. The holy day. All of these charismatics, all of these Pentecostals, bless them, love them. I'm a tongue-talking, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled believer myself. Have zero animosity or, uh, or angst against Spirit-filled believers. However, I was challenged several years ago, do not be a Pentecostal believer that doesn't know what Pentecost actually is. Pentecost is actually Shavuot and is the holy day that is identified in Leviticus 23. You are paying attention to the lamb that was slain. Most Christians got that down, but you're not really paying attention to what happens after the resurrection. The resurrection is just the beginning for the believers. Because then you count 
after you wave the resurrected Messiah in front of God, the, sac the sacrifice was acceptable now on your behalf. Then Jesus says, Wait for the promise of my Father. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit in power. You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is important for the new covenant believer to understand that we are just getting started. On May 28th, Thursday night, which happens to be my birthday, will be the countdown of Pentecost Shavuot. You take the seven days. You get yourself cleaned out. You purge whatever needs to be purged out. So that when the power, the anointing of Yahweh God falls upon you, there is no contamination, there is no interference, and God freely has the ability to flow through you without any hindrances of your own flesh. The countdown began. Passover. So for all the people that want to fight and argue about Passover or Easter, God has so much more for you than chocolate rabbits. God is saying, yes, you believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. You see what I've done for my son. You've seen how I've raised him up. Now, wait and see what I'm going to do with you. For all those who believe in my son, God says that he is now about to have you be. And that's why James says that we are some kind of first fruits. The first fruits resurrection is not just limited to Jesus. So when I gave a little riddle at the beginning, like what's the difference between uh, Leviticus uh, 23 and Numbers 28? Numbers 28 leaves out the resurrection of first fruits that is supposed to be just for you on your behalf, that which represents Christ. But then it goes, okay, you need to count, and then you offer a new first fruits offering wait if you're offering a new first fruits there had to be an old first fruits each one in his own order first christ christ is the first first fruits then those who belong to christ those who believe in him are the second first fruits we're still in the middle of this thing there is a reason why certain things seem to be getting dragged out because God's agenda has not changed. For God's people, he's still saying, yeah, so just keep staying on my timetable because I'm not done with my people. I'm getting my people ready for the second first fruit anointing. Shavuot, Pentecost. So he says you offer another grain offering. Now, what's interesting about this second first fruits offering that you offer, you've counted 50 days. So as Acts 2 says, it doesn't say when Pentecost came, it said when Pentecost had fully come because they were still counting from Passover, from right when, cru when Jesus was crucified, resurrected, then all of a sudden, comes back to the disciples and says, uh, now go wait for the promise of my father. It was no accident that when Shavuot or Pentecost fell, it was seven days, which was the Feast of Weeks. Now, something else happens. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was offered, that, that, that second, if we're counting them, we're just calling that the second holy day, even though it's connected with Passover. But it's a Feast of Unleavened Bread. But in Leviticus 23, when it talks about specifically Leviticus 
the second offering. It says you offer two loaves. Two loaves with leaven. How do we go from the Feast of Unleavened Bread to now a holy day where you now offer two loaves with leavened bread? If we are looking at this symbolically, I've said this to my congregation several times. Um, In 2008, our country experienced, for the first time, an African-American president. And I've been very clear on why I did not vote for him. It wasn't because... I was not excited or enthusiastic about the idea of the first African-American president. It's simply because I never put the priorities of men over the priorities of God's word. However, with that being said, there was hope in my heart. I did want there to be greater unity when it came to the ethnic tension. But the Spirit of the Lord told me something that I said in front of everybody in 2008. Because of all the hope that this was supposed to bring when it came to ethnic reconciliation. And I said, if you don't get the Jew-Gentile thing, you will never get the black-white thing. If you don't understand the necessity of the Jew and Gentile reconciliation, you will never see the reconciliation between black and white men. Because in God's eyes, the black man and the white men don't exist. It's just two Gentiles. So what this holy day represented is what Ephesians 2 brought into full clarity. It talks about you who were uncircumcised. Doesn't matter if your skin is black. Doesn't matter if your skin is lighter. Doesn't matter. Uncircumcised is a Gentile. You, Ephesians 2, who are a Gentile, were apart from Christ, strangers from the covenant of promise and from the commonwealth of Israel. But now, you who are afar off, Gentiles, doesn't matter if you're black or if you're white. You have now been brought near. Near to what? Israel through the blood of Christ. And that, those two people, the Jew and the Gentile, he's made those one. He didn't make the black man and the white man one because they were still already one because they were still Gentiles. The segregation, the racism that existed from a new covenant first century understanding was not between the black man and the white man. It was between the Jew and the Gentile. And this is how political that I'll get. Because I don't like dealing with the political, with the politics when it comes to Democrat and Republican. I stick with the politics within my own kingdom, within the own party that God has called me to be, which is in the kingdom of God. The politics. Many, many, many years ago,
a man named Bill McCartney, started an organization called Promise Keepers. And it did great things for men. Teaching men how to be men of God. Dealing with men's issues. So anything I say is not and will not take away from that. But when it comes to the politics within the kingdom of God, Bill McCartney started another organization. I happened to be attending the Messianic Synagogue where one of the people that, were, that was involved in his organization, that's how I found out about it, was, was highly involved in that. And God just told me to watch the response to the other ministry that Bill McCartney started versus the difference. Now, the first question that I still do today, hey, what was, everyone knows Promise Keepers, everyone remembers Promise Keepers. Hey, what was the other thing Bill McCartney started? And it is a deafening silence. Because what Bill McCartney did, he read Ephesians 2 accurately. He did not destroy the interpretation of Ephesians 2. He actually fulfilled it. He interpreted Ephesians 2 correctly. And though Ephesians 2 has been used to, be, to build bridges between other ethnicities, but when he understood, wait a minute, that wall, that wall of separation, that wall of separation wasn't between uh, black men and white men. That wall of separation was between Jew and Gentile. And he started an organization called Road to Jerusalem and most of the churches, all the Christian believers did not know about it, blew it off, and it literally went nowhere. The point being, if Ephesians 2 said that Christ took down the wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile, then you need to make sure that you're not suffering from a crisis of context. When did Christ take down that wall? It's by his blood. We have peace by his blood. When did Christ shed his blood? Well, Christ did it when he was crucified. And when was he crucified? He was crucified during Passover. So that's why the connection between Passover and reconciliation is necessary to understand at this moment. Because at this moment, despite that we've had a black president and beyond, racial tensions are the worst I've ever seen it in my life. You know why? Because if you don't get the Jew-Gentile reconciliation thing, you're not going to get the black-white reconciliation thing. Because the root, see, the black-white reconciliation thing is the symptoms, but the root is what it's always been. God's heart to unite Jew and Gentile as one. When Jesus died and shed his blood, that is the blood that made peace between the Jew and the Gentile. Jesus died on Passover. And the whole point of putting all of these, these, these sermons together was showing you what they said of the Council of Nicaea. Let us not have anything to do with the Jews. The violence, the rabble, these murders of our lords, these parasites. The whole point of starting Easter was to separate from that. Because Passover, at Passover, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews and the king of the nations, took the wall down, not between the black pastor and the white pastor, or the white girl and the black girl, but between the Jew and the Gentile. Passover, Jesus took that wall down, but Easter put the wall back up. And it's from Passover... Feast of Unleavened Bread, first fruits, is what kicks off the true power of God's reconciliation. Because from Passover, from Feast of Unleavened Bread, from first fruits, that's when you start counting seven weeks till Pentecost. Pentecost is not the birth of the church. 
Pentecost is the confirmation of Yahweh's covenantal promise to Jews and to Gentiles. So now, those who are in Christ, those who've experienced his mercy, his forgiveness, and his love, still have more to look forward to. On May 28th, that evening, that is the time to acknowledge when over 2,000 years ago, Yahweh confirmed his love, his grace, and his covenantal reality to Jews and Gentiles. So if you hear me and hear me well, the reason why this topic became a 1C22 distinctive, it wasn't because I was trying to make people uncomfortable at Easter. It wasn't because I was interested in arguing with, with my Christian brothers and showing them how I knew the Hebrew and how I could make them really feel stupid. No, it was about do you not understand the larger picture of God's plan, not just to save you, but to save Jews and Gentiles and to give you the confirmation that his covenantal promise has been fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth, his son. So another thing uh, within, within Judaism, The children of Israel, through the Passover lamb, were redeemed from Egypt, and they went into the wilderness. And as they were in the wilderness, one of the greatest encounters took place, because they came to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, Yahweh God himself came down with thunder and fire and lightning. And it was then when the word of God, written with the finger of God. Now remember what the finger represents. When Jesus says in uh, Matthew 12, when he's talking about, if I cast out devils, by the finger of God. And Luke says by the spirit of God because the finger of God also represents the spirit of God. If I cast out devils by the finger of God or the spirit of God, then the kingdom has come to you. They leave Egypt because of Passover. They meet Yahweh God on the mountain. He comes down in glory and fire and he delivers Moses the ten sayings, commandments, the covenant of the Torah written with the finger of God. Within Judaism, they believe That from the time they left Passover to the time they got to Mount Sinai and got the word of God, they believe it was seven weeks. They believe it was 50 days, which means it would have been on Shavuot, Pentecost, when the first covenant was confirmed. So whether you accept that or not, the reality is it was seven weeks. We know for sure 
Pentecost, Shavuot, when the second covenant was confirmed. So what I want to close with is this. He said, wait until the promise of my father. Things haven't manifested yet. Wait, it's not Pentecost yet. It's not Shavuot yet. Well, they've extended the the virus, uh, the, the quarantine for another two weeks. Well, praise God. It's not Pentecost yet. Yeah. Take your time. Because after I've done my seven days of making sure I'm purging, what this week started for me was my countdown of asking God for more of his promise, more of his spirit, more of his glory. Using this time. The purging's done. Now. It's about transitioning from maintaining to manifestation. Wait. Amen. Take your time. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things will be added to you. But seek it first. And as you seek it first, you begin to understand we are still counting down because God has called us. Also, Christ is the first fruit, but guess what? We are are the second first fruits. And Yahweh God, who celebrated his son on the first first fruits, is getting ready to celebrate us. So stay connected to the vine. Stay connected to the word of God. Stay connected to the promise of God. And make sure that you let nothing betray, counterfeit, or sabotage the promise that Yahweh God has you purposefully waiting for. In Jesus Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Yevarech Yahweh v'yishmerech. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh turn his presence, his countenance upon you, and give you shalom in Yeshua Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. I close wanting people to know, even though this was a message for those who are in Christ, there is still an opportunity for those who are outside of Christ, to know why Jesus died. He died for your sins, yes. But he didn't die just to take you to heaven. He died to live and dwell with you. He died to give you a plan, a purpose, a future. He also died so that you may know him and have his full glory manifested on earth as it is in heaven. Everything that God has for you on this side of eternity, The worst thing is to die without Christ. The worst thing is to die in your sins, not repenting of your sins, not having him come and be your Lord and Savior, not acknowledge him and confessing him with your mouth that he is the son of the living God, that he is Lord and that God did rise from the dead. The worst thing is to die in your sins. But I've come to believe and know that the second worst thing is to die without God doing everything that he could do in your life because you did not let him. The things that we cut ourselves off from, the times that we sacrifice God's plan for our life over and over and over and over again, and God's mercies are new every morning. Every morning is an opportunity for God to say, hey, for for, for God to say, hey, I'm still here. I still want to move in your life. If you don't know Jesus now, I'm asking you, not simply so that you get your fire insurance, not simply so that you don't uh, go to hell. I'm talking about, no, I do not want to see you live your life on this side of eternity. Maybe you're going to heaven, but you're still living here on earth in hell. 
He came to give you life and life more abundantly. And I'm not talking about bling. I'm not talking about Cadillacs. I'm not talking about chicks. I'm talking about knowing the power of the resurrected Messiah and having a full relationship with him to where his glory falls upon you as it fell on the believers in Acts chapter 2, as they were speaking in tongues, as they were prophesying what God did, the wonderful works of God specifically, and they began to move in the power, the signs and the wonders and the authority that God had ordained for them to walk in. So do not let the fear and the anxiety, and I'm not just talking about of what you see on, t on TV. If you're around someone that says they believe in Jesus and they're still prophesying fear to you, Yahweh God still says, fear not. The same love that I've experienced, that, that I know I'm asking you to consider and receive today, the same love that'll perfect you in his love and drive out all manner of fear. You can have that today also in Jesus' Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.